Hello, good morning, everyone. Welcome to reInvent, and welcome to our session AIM315S on Netflix success stories uh, on Intel. So my name is Harshad Sane. I'm a principal engineer at Intel, and you could describe my job as trying to squeeze the maximum performance out of uh, Intel instances on AWS with customers like Netflix. And we have Vadim Filanowski here from Netflix. Thanks, Harshad. Uh, good morning, everybody. My name is Vadim Filanowski. I'm a performance engineer at Netflix, and my job is very similar to Harshad's, is to make sure that Netflix runs smoothly, reliably, and uses as little resources as possible. Thank you, Vadim. Um, so in this talk, we are going to be talking about two parts, mostly on hardware monitoring and then AI usages. Which, and we'll go really deep on some of this stuff. But more importantly, it's important to remember this is about a collaboration story. And you'll see as, as the story unfolds. Um, so speaking about collaboration, uh, this kind of gives a timeline of how Intel has been working with Netflix on AWS. Um, there's a lot going on between the companies, but some of the external blogs are something you can look up. Um, they, they, we have been working on optimizing performance uh, uh, on, on uh, several of the services, as you can see. And Along that timeline, you can see the last blog there based on seeing on through hardware counters. And this is the blog we are going to kind of expand on and get into the story in the first half of our uh, section. So I think everyone knows Intel to be a microprocessor company. But maybe some of you know, some don't, that it has at least 15,000 software engineers in the background and providing software optimizations and contributing to a lot of software, including uh, you know, all the way from the base firmware, BIOS, virtualization layers, runtimes, application. In fact, Intel is the largest uh, contributor to the Linux kernel, um, uh, to JDK, OpenJDK, and so forth. Um, so Vadim, what's your experience been on Intel processors with your stacks? Yeah, so Harshad, uh, first of all, this slide, uh, this slide you are showing, uh, it almost entirely matches our stack. We run an AWS, uh, we use Intel Xeon processors, uh, obviously we deploy on Linux, uh, we use OpenSSL, Cassandra, TensorFlow, pretty much all the runtime languages. Uh, and, and I think ultimately it comes down not so much uh, uh, to the um, number of commits or the lines of codes that Intel commits to those open sources, but more to the expertise that Intel has, not only on the hardware level, but with a whole stack that runs on this hardware. Awesome. So this is going to be a fun question, but how many people have Netflix subscriptions here? Show of hands. Like that's, I know, <laughs> it was obvious. But, but we know Netflix as a media streaming company. We watched you know, all, all the content, but we want to, let's understand from Vadim, hey, what goes on behind the scenes, right? How, how, how does Netflix operate? Yeah, so Harshad, uh, there, is, there is a lot of debate, and I, I think it, it's not settled yet whether Netflix is a media company or technology company. So, but one thing is for sure, regardless of the answer, is we use a lot of compute resources, whether it's cloud gaming or machine learning applications or content creation or, or, or visualization. We also operate, obviously, a, a backplane that allows you to, that allows us to provide recommendations and render your home pages and mint licenses and manage accounts. We need a lot of compute. And um, we deploy an AWS on Intel, uh, Intel Xeon hardware, and we use all these um, all these offerings to power Netflix. Awesome. So now that we know of a few of the things Vadim talked about, we are going to get deep into one of the use cases, and for that we are going to look into observability at Netflix and then observability at Intel as well. Um, so we are going to go into deep into one of the use cases uh, with that and. Um, I'd like to learn about performance and reliability engineering at Netflix and how, how that operates. Yeah, Harshad, so uh, as a performance and reliability engineer, I see observability as a, as a foundation for everything we do. Without observability, we basically cannot do our job, we're blind. And I see it a little bit of, um, as an iceberg, right? So the tip of the iceberg is the thing we do, the changes that we make, 
and the bottom of the iceberg, that 90% that is kind of like under the water is all the work we do to make sure that we understand the system. So ultimately, observability, strong observability allows us to gain insight into the system behavior. And once we understand this behavior, we can leverage this insight to change, to change the characteristics of the system to our liking. A lot of times it's trade-offs, sometimes we can get everything with, uh, with our change. So we roughly define three levels of observability. Infrastructure level observability uh, gives us insight into overall traffic flow in our uh, ecosystem, into our overall utilization, uh, cost apportionment, things like that. Netflix deploys, uh, the whole stack is built on microservice architecture. It's not a monolithic app. It's a, it's a collection of microservices that communicate with each other. So the service or the tactical view uh, is very important. This view is very important for us because it gives us insight within each individual microservice. And as you can imagine, we collect a lot of um, pretty standard telemetry like throughput, saturation, uh, latencies, percentiles, breakdowns, uh, errors, things like that. There is a lot of telemetry in the service view that is uh, pertinent to our internal framework that emit business metric, and we use all that to monitor the behavior of those services. And yeah, yeah, yeah. go ahead. And, yeah. and I think um, it's it's just the three levels of observability. Um, you you kind of bought. Uh, you know, you, you kind of get calls about, hey, something's wrong, and how do you apply these three levels? Is, is that one of the use cases you could describe? Right. So, well, the last level uh, of observability is an instance level observability, where we actually um, look at things like uh, a little bit deeper uh, system metrics, or we can run ad hoc profiling, like perf-based flame graphs, or a Java Flight Recorder or Async Profiler to gain insight into actually what's going on within that instance. Um, there is, however, uh, we found there is a class of problems that require even deeper level of observability to introspection at CPU level. And here is one of those, one of those problems that, um, that Harshad and I worked together. So it started off as a routine migration. We wanted to migrate one of our microservices from M5 4XL to M5 12XL. So I call it routine because uh, we do it every so often to make sure we use the capacity and our reservations that we have to the fullest extent. If we have spare capacity, we might want to consolidate on a different instance types. So this seemed like a straightforward migration. We expected about 3x improvement in throughput with about the same latency and CPU utilization. So when we actually deployed it, uh, we found out that we're far, uh, far below our target. We actually got to maybe a, a 20% improvement in throughput at the same CPU utilization. And you can see it uh, on the graph on the left. But that's not all. We see a really, really weird pattern. We see a bimodal CPU distribution uh, in our fleet. And you can see it in the graph on the right. We see a clear band of good nodes at the bottom that have lower CPU utilization. They have lower latency. And at the same throughput, we have a higher band of nodes that have higher CPU utilization, higher latency. They, they have exactly the same workload. And that was our starting point for investigation. So the first pattern, not being able to squeeze 3x throughput, was puzzling. But the second, that the split of CPU, the bimodal distribution of CPU, was even more puzzling to us. So I have a question. Um, so in the bimodal distribution there, uh, it looks like there's a specific pattern there. Is, 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 could it be because of you were running on different zones or maybe, you know? Ah, yes. Uh, good point. So, no, we checked uh, zone affinity. And actually, as a matter of fact, the graph that we're showing here on the right uh, was captured in a single zone. There is, however, one property of this distribution that we noticed but couldn't explain. 
The property is that no matter how we auto scale, and you can clearly see the pattern of auto scaling, and instances going up and down, however, we always see between 12 to 13 percent of the nodes in the, in the bottom, in the good band. That's, that's interesting. So I just want you to remember this 12 percent magic number because it's going to play on later. It's, a, it's kind of a fun hint. Okay, so great problem to bring to the table, Vadim. So like Netflix showed their observability stack and there's a methodology to go about finding the issues, Intel kind of does the same. And you can see the stack of the methodology that Intel follows. And at each level of this methodology, you'll find the tools that have also been open sourced or you can find them on intel.com to be able to use as you go step by step diagnosing things. And the diagnosis may apply to something as deep as what Vadim found, or it could be just, hey, I don't know, I'm running my service. Is there some performance I could extract from it? Is there TCU I'm leaving on the table? And you could still follow the same methodology. The first part of the methodology there um, uses health checks, which means it's going to check the health of your system from the hardware point of view and from the software point of view. And we have the tool over there called Intel System Health Inspector that allows you to do that. And it's a simple tool that runs in three or five minutes, whether you're on-prem, whether you're in the cloud, whether, right? And it will kind of give a snapshot of what your perfect system should look like versus what your system is looking like. And those differences help you diagnose what's happening. Second is hardware characterization. Now, this is a very important place where I'm going to talk about what is a PMU or a performance monitoring unit, which is a hardware unit inside of the CPU. And that allows us to actually see how the resources are being utilized as applications are running on it. So we'll be giving some examples of hardware characterization and the tools that were used by uh, Netflix in the same. Following that, once we know where the resources are being constrained, we can use those particular constraints and then do software profiling on them. Uh, and then be able to find which part of code is actually being affected by the problem, or parts of code, if, if that be. And then we've got other, other streams like right-sizing instances and optimizing, uh, whether it's statically or dynamically through granulate, and you might have heard them in other breakout sessions as well. So given that, let, let me give you a quick snapshot of what System Health Inspector looks like. This is a, it's got a lot more than this. We are trying to fit this in a small page, but essentially on the left-hand side, you'll see the hardware configurations that you would find, even dim populations, so it'd be uh, the system details, um, uh, everything that you're able to find on the system uh, on the hardware side. And then it also uh, optionally does micro benchmarking, where you can see latency and memory bandwidth curves that will be generated by the system, what you should expect and what you're actually seeing on the system. Additionally, it is also going to throw your software versions, uh, things like what your NICs are doing, what the disks are doing, what your uh, processes are running, and based on that, it can even generate recommendations saying, hey, I see you're running a lot of OpenSSL. Had you been on an M6i instance, you can make use of, your, of our new um, ISAs and actually gain 20, 30% performance from them. So it can give a whole recommendation tab of what you might be missing and keeping on the table. So following that, now let's get to hardware characterization. So M7i instances, how, how many people have used M7i instances, or at least tried them? So not surprised, they're really, really new out there, and I'd like to give some information besides the fact that uh, this is the seventh generation on AWS of Intel instances, and they also expose um, core performance counters. So remember the PMU that I was talking earlier about? It is going to give us deeper observability on what the CPU has been doing. And now you can do that on any M7i instances irrespective of its size. Previously, uh, we could only do them on metal instances, but now you've got core performance counters um, uh, on all M7 instances. And we are going to showcase how we use them and diagnose this uh, particular issue. So we used PerfSpec, which is an open source tool that we develop, uh, which kind of wraps around what the PMU does and presents uh, that data. So I handed over PerfSpec to Vadim and said, hey Vadim, can you capture this data on the bad instances and the good instances and let us see what, what that looks like. So Vadim, how has your experience been on <coughs> the same? Yeah, well, so first of all, uh, it was pretty easy to run PerfSpec and um, this is the, the summarization of the results. 
So uh, we highlighted the relevant lines here. So we see that CPU utilization on a bad node is about 150% uh, over what we see on a good node, which matches clearly, it matches our observations, our telemetry that we already captured. So the second highlighted line, the CPI, is pretty interesting. CPI is cycles per instruction. So knowing that workload on these instances is about the same, we see that CPUs are spending 175% uh, more cycles per instruction. To execute the same instruction, we spend more cycles on a bad node. So I think it kind of matches with CPU utilization, but again, it still doesn't give us a clue of where the problem is. Right. So the third highlighted line is uh, L1 cache bound. That was pretty puzzling to us because we wouldn't see, we wouldn't understand why the same workload would give different L1 uh, cache boundedness results. Uh, and lastly, the machine clears, and I think, Harshad, you better speak about like how to interpret machine clears, because for me, it was the first time I encountered that counter. Sure, sure. Um, before we get to machine clears, like, like Vadim said, uh, it looks like a magic number of 3x everywhere, right? CPI, which is an indicator of performance, has gone up by 3x. Vadim seeing, um, in broad, he's seeing 3x latencies and CPU utilization uh, levels. Um, L1 boundedness, just that's puzzling because it's the exact same CPU, except it, all you have done is having more 3x amount of the cores. And L1 basically says that this is my uh, first level of cache. This is the closest in latency I can get to data. But hey, I'm spending 3x amount of the time fetching data from there. Why would that be? And it also shows machine clears count go high, and machine clears are generally indicative of memory disambiguation, pipeline stalls or flushes, uh, self-modifying code even, and there's gonna be a good curious case about that. So what we do now is that, hey, we know where the resource is being spent, but we still don't know where in code this might be happening. So we use these particular counters of L1 boundedness and machine clears and feed it to our next tool in software profiling, which was our third step. Right? So in our third step, we are gonna use Intel VTune Profiler, right? Um, this allows us to use the same PMU counters that we showed in the previous slide, but now we are going to do sampling as opposed to counting. And sampling, uh, as you would know like with Perf, allows you to capture instruction pointers, which means now you would be able to associate those particular counters that were showing as, you know, uh, very high. Uh, and associate them with, with uh, the code. So in VTune, you can see there's a snapshot where on the left-hand side, you see the function, which are hot, and on the right-hand side, you see CPI, and they have been sorted by the machine clearers. So on the top, you see these functions having an enormously high CPIs of you know, eight and seven. So what's the next step? Now we know that these are some of the top hot functions, what VTune allows you to do is double click on those functions and now we get even deeper. Now it spits out this data in the middle block there which shows you assembly code or what the code, the machine instructions that uh, the CPU is gonna be uh, executing. And we are going to diagnose some of this um, in, in, in the next slide. So now we are getting to the root cause. So we did find that if you look at the bottom block there of the block of instructions where the machine was spending most amount of time in L1 boundedness, which is what we saw, there I have highlighted two lines specifically in yellow there. You can see that there is a particular register, um, R RDI I believe being uh, accessed uh, by one thread at an offset of 20, and in the bottom, the same register is being written to but at an offset of 18. Now why is that important is because the CPU operates in uh, units of data called as cache lines, which are 64 bytes. You may be aware of memory being accessed in a page, page level. Similarly, CPUs access data in 64 bytes at a time. Now, if one thread is accessing data in different section of that 64 bytes, and it's independently accessing it, and another thread is accessing 
a different set of data, but on that same cache line, now the CPUs have to do cache coherence, which means that I want to be make sure that I'm consistent and there's no functional faults. So it's going to be bouncing that cache line around from core to core, even though the sets of data being accessed are completely independent. And the reason that happens is, by nature, you declare a variable, you declare a second variable, and you start computing, right? You don't think that the variable should be uh, set apart by 64 bytes. Um, but that is the particular case that happened here in the JDK, and this is known as false sharing. Now, the reason it exhibits phenomenally higher here is because false sharing was always present, even in the case where Vadim was running on, a, on the smaller machine on 4XL. It's just that instead of the two CPUs bound, bouncing those cache lines, imagine now 48 CPUs bouncing these cache lines around. Imagine the latency uh, perturbations you're going to have even if you're running out of your L1. So now that we know this was fault sharing, Vadim, can you explain how this particular piece of code, which is not even in your application, it's in JDK, was affecting um, the application? Yeah. Uh, Harshad, so first of all, uh, I, I have to admit, as a performance engineer, I knew about false sharing. Uh, you read about it in textbooks, and it's described. Uh, however, I didn't expect to see it in JDK or in the code that runs uh, on, on JVM. So that was a pretty fascinating find. Uh, another thing is uh, VTune did a really great job of highlighting this problematic piece of code. So the ability to, to break down the counters by the line of code and then drill down into assembly is very, very powerful, and none of other existing profilers gives you the same ability. So then back to the actual cause, right? So just to explain a little bit what's going on here, for those of you who are familiar with Java, though secondary, uh, Java has something that it's called secondary superclass cache. Secondary superclass is essentially an interface. Java doesn't support multiple inheritance, it's only single inheritance, but you can extend, uh, implement multiple interfaces, and those become your secondary superclasses. So then every time you do an explicit cast, instance of, or even call a method of an interface, JVM does a type check. Generally, we assume that those type checks are very, very fast. And that generally is true because JVM has machinery that we usually don't see. It's within JVM itself to cache the, super, uh, the, the secondary superclasses. Now, a certain class hierarchy and a certain usage pattern can expose uh, the slow code path uh, within, within that, that secondary uh, super class lookup. So what was happening, if you think about our hierarchy, let's say we have a video object, and this video could be uh, an episode, or it could be a season, it could be a trailer, it could be a movie. Uh, there is multiple things we can operate with. Now, those are all interfaces that our video object implements. By repeatedly checking, type checking it against multiple different interfaces, we're essentially blowing up the cache. We keep writing, JVM keeps, keeps, uh, keeps writing to the last found uh, secondary superclass. That's where this false sharing come from. And it just so happened that in JVM, the single element cache, the, 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 the secondary super cache, is adjacent, the field is adjacent to the list of all secondary super classes. So it's a classic, essentially it becomes a classic example of false sharing when one thread writes to the cache line and another thread keeps reading from the same cache line uh, and this cache line is being flushed. Now, here is an interesting part. Remember how we said, oh, hey, we only we always see 12, 13% of the node in the bottom range? Yeah. Now think about it. The cache line is 64 byte. The pointer is eight byte. So it's eight, eight pointers per cache line. We have a seven in eight chance of these two pointers being within the same cache line. And we have one in eight chance of, this, of these two pointers being in different cache lines. And that's exactly, one in eight is 12.5%. So that's exactly what we saw in our telemetry. This was absolutely fascinating find. 
That, that is really fascinating. That exactly goes with your um, observations. But so like, like Vadim has said, you know, this was a really big deep dive. But like his iceberg story that you might have seen, the solution is probably quite simple, right, Vadim? Absolutely, Harshad. And there couldn't be a better example of this iceberg analogy. So the fix was to simply insert the pattern, 64 byte pattern between, between these two pointers. There was zero code changes. The only thing we changed is the data layout. That's it. So we recompiled JDK, we redeployed our service, and you can see the results here. It's pretty dramatic. So the higher band of node just simply disappeared. It's gone. So the highlighted area is when we did our deployment. And you can see that now uh, we have a much, much tighter distribution of both CPU and latency. Awesome. That is really cool. And you know, Netflix could just patch the Java and could actually do it. But for OpenJDK users, Intel has already upstreamed this patch uh, into OpenJDK. And, and you, know, we, we, you can learn more from it from the blog, which is in, in, um, as a link in, in our presentation. That's, that's great. What, what about uh, further results on, on this finding? Yeah, we didn't stop there. So that was only the first step in our journey. We also encountered the true sharing, and uh, we addressed it as well. So um, our time here is limited, and we wanted to talk to you about other use cases as well. But uh, we refer you to our blog post. The link is provided on this slide to read more about our second step of addressing the true sharing, and also to learn more about um, about secondary superclass. It's called type pollution in Java and other work that community did around that and maybe you're affected as well. So, but uh, at the end of this exercise, we achieved three and a half X improvement of our throughput. Uh, three and a half times more throughput. So remember, we went from four XL to 12 XL expecting three X or around that, maybe a little bit less than three X because it's not linear, we understand that. Now, we got three and a half X throughput at the same CPU utilization at the same or lower latency. So that, that, was, uh, that was a great story and a great, uh, great optimizations that we did together. Thank you, Vadim. So excited to even talk about that story again. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, now let's move on to our second use case and how can we go without talking about AIs? But, um, in this particular use case, we are going to talk about a few usages uh, of AI within, within Netflix. I'm sure there are many, uh, as, as everyone would suspect, but uh, could you walk us through, um, you know, how, how, how does Netflix use AI? Yeah, well, so in a day and age where AI writes poems and drives cars and, and, and creates art, uh, well, you bet we use AI. There is multiple usages of it. Our usages are, are a little bit more practical. So, and we'll be talking about one of those. Um, we use it as a part of our encoding pipeline. But um, before we go to that use case, just a little bit about how Netflix does encoding and, um, uh, and, and how we deal with our, our video assets. Okay. I think it's my turn to do a little trivia. So who knows which show this, this screenshot is from? I see raised hands, yes, awesome, okay. It's from the Money Heist, great show. Uh, okay, now, a harder question. Who can tell the difference between these two, between these two pictures? At least I can't. I'm growing uh, old. Ah, okay. <laughs> I, I need to talk to you after the show. <laughs> <laughs> but, but, but this, this, okay. These images are designed to look the same. So I can reveal that the difference between the images is one of them encoded at 680 kilobit per second, and another is encoded at 252 kilobit per second. So perceptually, they're very, very similar. It's hard for humans to see the differences in those images. Uh, we use our encoding optimization to reduce bit rates without, without loss in perceived quality. I see. 
But 680 kbps and 252 in this modern era of gigabit, I mean, does it really matter? Uh, yeah, you might say uh, you have 50 or 100 or, or, or a, a gigabit internet at home, um, but not everybody is privileged to have such higher speeds. So there's part of the world like maybe Central Asia or parts of uh, Latin America or let's say India where people uh, people most they can get is 4G cellular networks or sometimes even 3G cellular networks. For them, lower bit rate is the difference between being able to stream Netflix and not being able to stream it. So there is another use case. We as Netflix benefit from it as well. We use our content delivery network, Open Connect, to, to host these resources. Lower bit rates means we can host more, more of these movies and deliver them with higher quality. Well, and lastly, I think everybody can relate to this. Lower bit rates means that when you download content on your devices, let's say for a long haul flight, uh, you, you, you can download more. I think everybody uh, uh, like has this problem. You're traveling, you have a 10 hour flight and you need to download movies and video and some, something for your kids to watch and sometimes you run out of space. So this kind of optimizations uh, also optimize the space. So it has the benefit all around. Interesting. Yeah. So moving on, uh, talking about encoding pipeline at Netflix, 10,000 foot view of it is from the source that we get from the studios, which is a, a high quality, uh, high resolution source encoded uh, in a format that mostly uh, is not supported by consumer level devices. First, we put it through a down sampler. We use a neural network to down sample. Then we encode it and then on the device, we decode it and then upsample it. Right. We need to downsample it because we cannot possibly support all resolutions. There is such a variety of devices that, that we run on that it's, it's impossible for us to know all resolutions. We encode in a handful of resolutions. The rest of it is downsampling and upsampling. Got it. And is this a single pipeline or how much compute and optimizations does this require? Right, so um, talking about pipeline, well, everybody kind of like familiar with the concept of encoding. Uh, some of you might even have done it at home and like, well, here's, here's the chunk of video and you put it through encoding or some kind of uh, uh, processing and maybe two or three hours later, uh, it comes out of it. So for us, it would be prohibitively expensive to do it this way. So we have a parallelized pipeline. We split the video in smaller chunks and we run encoding and validations and checks uh, on this video, on these chunks in parallel. So it has, it has certain benefits. First of all, it allows us to prioritize content. If there is certain content that we need to encode urgently, we can simply put more compute to it and encode it uh, pretty quickly. There is also the flip side of it is that if there is something that we want to re-encode at a lower priority in the background, we can reuse some of the spare capacity that we already have that is not currently used for serving regular Netflix traffic. We can repurpose this capacity for encoding. So, and that is why we don't have specialized hardware to run encoding. It run on the same regular instances, M, uh, C, R, whatever we have. So it's extremely important for us to make sure that it runs quickly as much uh, with, with, with as high performance as possible on CPU, on regular CPUs. Now, going a little bit, uh, a little bit further, we do per title optimizations on, uh, on our videos. If you think about it, say cartoon, right? And an action movie, they're very different in the sense that cartoon is kind of simpler. We intuitively understand it. There is maybe large, large, large chunks of a similar color. There is less movement. And we can encode, we can compress them a little bit further to get a, a lower bit rate with the same perceived quality. For action movies, 
we might apply a very different recipe. We need to encode it maybe uh, at a higher bit rate uh, to preserve all this quality and, and, and movement. We also apply per chunk optimizations. Next slide. And lastly, our dynamic optimization introduces something that we call per shot optimization. We define a shot as a, as a group of frames with a similar pixels. So for example, if you think about a shot of, um, of an actor's face uh, against some backdrop, and like we can, uh, uh, we can show it for a few seconds, that could be a shot. Very little changes within that time frame. So we can encode it, we can find those shots, and we can encode it as a single unit and apply optimizations. So what that allows us to do is to create a variable rate bit stream. So uh, different quantization parameters and different shots, we can walk this matrix of, of uh, different encodes and shots, and we can find either the highest average quality at a given bit rate, or we can find a lowest average bit rate with a given quality. That's, that's fascinating. It's, it's fun to learn about what was going on behind when I'm watching Netflix on my phone or TV, right? But it, c getting back to AI, could you go a little deeper into how the down sampler actually utilizes AI here? <clears throat> right, so focusing on the down sampler use case, so uh, down sampling and up sampling is unavoidable. There has, to be, there has to be some amount of it simply because we don't know the resolution of, uh, of the device. So we want to optimize it as much as possible. So what we did is we figured that applying, applying um, a machine learning, given the question, when we give an input image, what is the best downsampled representation of this image that would, that would result in the highest upsampled quality? We know the upsampler. We know that part. So, but give us the best representation of downsampled image. So we trained our neural network with that premise. And this is kind of like the conceptual diagram. It actually a little bit similar to how uh, noise canceling used to work, we apply a mask, we generate a mask. You can see that little tiny image in the middle yeah. that, that, we, uh, that we get by applying the convolutional layers. So we have several convolutional layers. In the end, we come up with a mask, then we do a simple bicubic uh, down sampling, apply the mask to it, and then it yields better result when, uh, when we upsample the resultant image. I see. So when you downsample, you know, quality is, of course, very important to you. What's the scale of it? Like, does 1% really matter to you? Yeah, uh, Harshad, any, um, anything, like, it, it's all matter to us. If you think about it, we use a VMAF score uh, to, to assess the video quality. And even a few points on VMAF is perceptible to humans. Well, what is VMAF, Vadim? Um, VMAF is variable um, multi, uh, multi-function video uh, assessment okay. that Netflix developed. Uh, I think it's pretty much industry standard for uh, assessing the, the, the video quality. So the VMAF score tries to replicate how humans perceive video. Higher score means better quality. Got it. So we got, uh, we got a, few, uh, a few points higher on the VMAP scale uh, with down sampler, but that's not all. We, always, uh, we also were able to improve our quality of experience metrics. With down sampled videos, we have less rebuffers and less play, uh, play starts, and the play delay is reduced as well. So it's a win-win. It's a the only thing, of course, is, well, it's resource intensive. Got it. So being resource intensive, how have you been running you know, down sampling and then coding pipeline on Intel instances in AWS and how has this benefited you so far? Uh, yeah, so um, as I mentioned earlier, we don't have specialized hardware for this pipeline. It's, uh, it's easier for us, we get more benefits. 
uh, when we run it on general hardware and we harvest our unused capacity. So it's imperative that the performance of the downsampling and the whole uh, encoding pipeline uh, that we squeeze the maximum performance on regular uh, Intel Xeon processors. So with the, with the improvements uh, that Intel helped us to implement, we were able to achieve anywhere between 15% to 2x uh, improvement in frames per second in our overall encoding pipeline. So we were using uh, one DNN, and of course it runs on Intel hardware. Yeah. That's, that's great, 15% to 2x. So let me explain a little bit of how the 15% to 2x uh, comes about. So we are again gonna drive a little deeper, and this is kind of the view of what it looks like inside the Intel processor when you're doing vectorization, which is, which is what is used in, at the lowest level uh, for some of the neural network applications. So Intel's instruction set, um, Many years ago, it's been, you know, since seven, eight years since AVX512 has been launched, which is essentially uh, with fuse multiply ads units, you are able to complete the operation in three cycles with 512 bit with vectors on an int 8 operation. So we've had this for a long time. It can do 85 int 8 such operations uh, per cycle. And M6i, C6i, or the sixth generation of Intel processors on AWS, also codenamed as Ice Lake, came up with VNNI, or Vectoral Neural Network Instruction. This instruction essentially is gonna shrink this into one cycle. So it allows you to do the same fuse multiplier add as an extension to AVX512, but now in just one cycle. So that itself is great. But now let's go onto M7Is, which are the recently launched Sapphire Rapids instances um, on, on AWS. And now you can actually see it, this thing is kind of going on steroids, right? Because um, what it introduces is known as AMX, which is uh, which uh, extends uh, AVX 512 even further, uh, and what it adds are two more use cases. It basically adds a two-dimensional register file, so you can have your uh, matrices in memory uh, being populated into registers, and at the same time, it introduces a new accelerator in sil silicon called as TMUL, which you know we call these register files as tiles, as you can see in the VNNI, that one block is a tile, and then it can actually do tiled matrix multiplied operation. So now you can do almost 8x time that the previous generation did, and you have 2,048 int 8 operations per cycle. So with AMX you, and matrix extensions, you can uh, basically get a lot out of the box with the data learning accelerator. So this is all what's going on inside the processor, right? And, but how do we really use it? How do, how do regular um, you know, developers make use of it? So Intel makes this easy by introducing the 1DNN or the, or the neural network library, the deep neural network library, and uh, it is highly optimized implementation for you know, new, new neural networks to do basically SIMD operations, softmax, you know, regression, analysis, um, uh, all low-level operations, but in addition, it also does operations such as prefetching, uh, making sure memory layouts are correct, memory bandwidth optimizations, um, in addition to, to the SIMD and AMX. So this, uh, and, and with highly parallelized operations with the tiles, you can actually get multiple X performance. Um, uh, at the CPU level, and then I, uh, like Vadim saw, 15% to 2X in his case, in. Uh, that application. But remember, Vadim was running on you know, the uh, six i generation of processors, so uh, there is still much more to benefit from in the seven generation of uh, processors. So with that, I'd like to summarize that um, you know, with the new seven generation of Intel processors, um, you get the new monitoring uh, hardware monitoring capabilities with which you can garner uh, more by actually getting uh, uh, better, deeper observability, as well as you can improve your TCO. And with the new innovative technologies with accelerators, along with AMX, which is present on every instance on the 7 series, uh, you can actually get much better performance on your machine learning workloads. Yeah, the results we presented uh, speak for themselves. At Netflix, we had great results on Cascade Lake uh, uh, hardware, on Ice Lake, and we're looking forward to further collaboration on, um, 
on Sapphire Rapids. Uh, but I think the real differentiator is uh, Intel's investment in software and Intel's expertise in optimizing uh, for these platforms. Thank you for making Netflix better. Thank you, Vadim. Thank you. <laughs>